Hello Internet. Today we are going to talk about LCW data compression. And I record this video right now exclusively for YouTube as an introduction to the stream recordings that I will put online. Uh, in those streams you can see how I actually implement LCW decoding in the context of uh, PDF data streams. And I wanted to make a general introduction in order to make the uh, video, the videos a bit more useful and, and, and more easily consumable for you. So let's um, talk about LCW. It's a very old and uh, frequently used uh, data compression scheme. And we will concentrate only on the decompression in the following videos, because that's what we need in order to read PDF uh, data streams. And there is a description in the PDF standard of LCW. It's this section in the PDF standard 7442, details of LCW encoding, but it's uh, a description that is not easy to read and understand. So I want to introduce the algorithm with some general explanations to make it more clear. LCW is used in lots of uh, data and image formats like GIF image format, for example, or the TIFF image format also su supports LCW and PDF uh, supports LCW compression. We will concentrate on the viewpoint of the decoder. The input to our decoder will be the bitstream that has been produced by the LCW encoder. And I call it a stream of, of bits rather than bytes because the individual symbols in this stream are not necessarily aligned at byte boundaries. So that is our input. Our output will be a sequence of bytes representing the uncompressed data. And the principle of the decoder is very simple. So first we have a step that uh, separates the bit streams into code words of a variable length. So we have conceptually a little block that gets as input the bit stream and it gets the current code length in bits. And in the context of uh, PDF LCW streams, this code length is 9, 10, 11 or 12 bits. There are other instances of LCW uh, compression that go to higher code length, so maybe up to 16 bits, but always the lower limit is 9. Um, as you will see, nine is the smallest code length that makes sense. So this box here conceptually divides the incoming bit stream and always pulls off a code, an integer that uh, comprises the given number of bits. And this can change, this length can change from uh, one code word to the next because the, the code length is adaptive. Okay, and once we have this code, we just have one step left basically. We have a lookup table and this table has 
for every possible code, um, it has a prefix code and a final byte. So it's called the extension byte. And the table is defined to have some initial content that is very simple. So initially, the contents of the tables are the following, that for codes from zero to 255, the prefix will be empty. So there will be no prefix. And the extension byte will simply be the code itself. So this means if we get, for example, here code 45, we look into the table, we see we have no prefix to the code and the extension byte is 45. And so we will simply write the byte 45 to the output. So if we would only get uh, such codes, <clears throat> there would actually be no um, data expansion happening here. In fact, it would be wasteful because we would be working with 9-bit uh, code length and we would be translating each 9-bit code word into an 8-bit byte. So that would not be very useful. Uh, but now we come to the other entries of the table. So we have two special entries. We have um, 256, which is a command for clearing the table. And we have 257, which is a command for ending the stream. So that marks the stream end. And then starting with, um, sorry, Starting with 258, we have the interesting entries that actually encode a prefix. And now the crucial idea and the cleverness of LCW encoding is that this whole table that is used for, for decompression does not need to be stored alongside the compressed data. But this table is adaptively built synchrono synchronously by the encoder and the decoder. It's built in a deterministic way uh, that only depends on the uncompressed data. And this guarantees that the encoder and the decoder will, at every point in the stream, will use the same table contents. And therefore, the table does not need to be uh, added to the stored data. It is always reconstructed during decompression. And it's quite simple for the decompressor to build this table. So I already described the initial contents. And also, if you get a table clear command 256, a code word 256, this table is reset to exactly this uh, contents and the code length is reset to the initial code length of nine bits. So how is this table filled? It works in the following way. Let's say uh, we get a code word as, as the first uh, code word after clearing the table or after starting. And let's say this code is 45. In this case, uh, we do nothing to the table and we just output 45. Let's now say the next code word is 46. So again, we will output 46. Nothing special going on here. But now we will create a table entry because the previous code was 45 and the new code is 46. 
And so we will create a new table entry. In this case, it's entry 258. It will have an extension byte of 46 and the prefix code will be the previous code that we have, that is 45. And this means the following, that whenever we now in the future get from the encoder, get the code word 285, it means that we must first uh, produce the output 45 and then the output 46. So the encoder can use this single 9-bit number to encode the sequence of these two 8-bit bytes. So uh, amounting to a 16 to 9-bit uh, compression ratio in this case. This same idea is repeated in every step. Let's say we already have defined this code 258 with the prefix 45 and the extension 46. So if we get code 285, we know that we will produce this output. So first 45, then 46. And now let's say the next, the next code we get is 47. So what will happen is that again, we create a table entry, 259, but now the prefix code will be the previous code that we had again and this is now a code that actually itself represents more than one output character. Extension byte will be this one, so 47. So now we have entered a code in the table that represents three characters because it, the prefix is are defined by table entry 285 and this is itself represents two characters 45 46 and then 259 has the additional 47 and in this way longer and longer sequences are represented by table entries where we have the invariant that for every table entry that represents a sequence of n bytes, there also will be a table entry representing the first n minus one bytes of this sequence. Uh, that's why we can store this uh, in, in this way that we, we encode the prefix by a, symbol, by a single number that just references a, a table um, entry. When we get now code 259, from the encoder, we will walk the, the table. So we will first walk backwards from 259 to 258, there we get 45, and now we will uh, walk forward again. So we will produce 45, 46, and 47 as the outputs. And again, we will add a new uh, table entry. So let me put it here in this case because I don't have space anymore. It will be entry 260. It will have a prefix of the previous code, which in this case is 47 and will have an extension that is the first byte produced by this sequence. So 259 produced 45, 46, 47. So the first byte it produced was 40, 45. So this will be the, the new entry. So the rule is at every step, we produce the output that is represented by the code word. And then we create a new entry that has as its prefix the previous code we encountered. And as an extension byte, it has the first byte uh, corresponding to the sequence we have added to the output. If you look at this article from, from the 1980s where Terry Welch describes this, um, this algorithm. So um, he is the W in LCW. So it's from uh, Lambert Siv Welch. I hope I'm pronouncing this 
correctly and the decoding is described why is it described no oh, i missed it here yeah, this is the This is the, the decompression algorithm in pseudocode. That's basically what I just described, just more abstractly notated. And there is one special code, one special case that I have not yet explained. And this special case caused me a bit of a headache in, in, in implementation of the SCW decoding because it's not really explained in the PDF standard. You have to either either read um, the original paper or the, the TIFF standard or figure it out for yourself somehow how this special case is meant to work. It occurs when we get a code that is not yet in the table. So let's say we have um, a clear table. We previously got a code like 45 that is already in the table of course because it's in the initial table contents so we have produced 45 and now we get a code that we do not know yet for example we get the code 258 which is the first unknown code that we can have and for this the handling of the uh, decoding is um, specified as follows. If you get this code that you do not know yet, it means that you should add a table entry that has as its prefix the previous code and that has as its extension byte the first byte produced by the previous code. So in this case also 45. And then you immediately output this sequence. So we would output here 45, 45, making altogether three 45s here. So that's, that's the special case that we need uh, to handle. We create a new entry with the previous code and the first byte produced by the previous code. That's all. The last thing that I need to explain is when is the code length increased? And that's actually uh, a bit of a tricky topic because there are different variants of implementations out there that increase the code length at different times. I mean, Normally you would increase the code length as late as possible in order to get um, good data compression. So first let's, let's think about what, what is the latest point where we need to increase the, the code length. Let's say we are currently working with code length 9. The question is at which point do we have to switch to the next code length 10. The answer is as soon as we have added entry 511 here, we must switch to the next code size, namely 10. And the next code we take from the bit stream must be a 10 bit code. Why is that? You might say, okay, I can still, if I have entries 0 to 511, I can still encode them in 9 bits. That's true, but you have to keep in mind that there is this one special case that the encoder can give you a code that you do not yet have in the table. So it always needs, <clears throat> it always needs uh, one entry more that it can address. So you have a kind of um, virtual additional entry that is always 
the one after the one you just created. So if you have created 511, you also need to be able to address 512. And this is the first number for which you need the 10 bits. So the rule is um, after adding entry two to the k minus one, set code length to uh, k plus one. That would be the, the smartest choice. So that is the latest possible, uh, latest, latest possible uh, point in time when you need to increase the, the code length. The problem is that there are buggy implementations of LCW out there and have been out there for a long, long time, so for decades now, that actually increase the code length one step early. So they would increase after generating uh, entry 510, they would already increase the code size. And these Buggy implementations have become so common that Adobe defined a filter parameter for the LCW decoding filter in the PDF spec that actually switches between these two variants. Early change for LCW decoding. And if this is zero, the algorithm uses the smart variant so that does it as late as possible and if this early change is one then um, the switch to the longer code length is done one step earlier and that's actually the default for pdf because these buggy implementations are so common the implementation of all of this is quite straightforward uh, the only thing that makes it a bit annoying is that when you get a code representing a sequence of multiple bytes, due to the way that the sequences are stored in the table with this kind of post order uh, storing, the table lookup actually provides the bytes to you in the reversed order. And, and so you, you must somehow revert the order from what you read from the table uh, in order to produce the correct order in the output. And there are of course different strategies that you can use. The one that we will uh, do in the following videos where I implement this is that we use a, a data buffer, an additional data buffer with a last in first out storage, so basically a stack. And when we walk the table, looking up the, uh, the sequence, we push the bytes into this um, replay buffer. And then we um, reverse the bytes by reading the replay buffer backwards and producing output bytes from that. So that's the only complication that you can deal with, that you have to deal with. Uh, there are of course other ways you could store the prefix length in this table and then you could try to uh, if, if your output is a RAM buffer as, as usual then you could immediately put uh, the bytes in, in the correct order by going backwards in this, in this RAM buffer because you know the initial uh, offset that you have uh, to use for placing the last byte. But this of course increases the size of this uh, table, so that's that's the downside. Yeah, it would also be an option. I have not benchmarked these two variants yet to to compare what is what is faster. Also, um, it would be more difficult for us because you could have the case that you have to produce a sequence that is actually longer than the space that you have left in the output buffer. 
and with the stack it's no problem to handle this case because we can just keep part of the stack and replay it later once we get more space in the output buffer but with the uh, with the explicit length in the table and the direct placement this would be uh, difficult to to implement i hope this was interesting to you and if so please consider liking and subscribing and maybe you want to take a look at the following videos uh, in this series where I actually implement the LCW data compression for PDF streams. See you.